and then we'll break and then, then we'll do a, a questions for Corbett after that so and then we'll just do short questions so um Kevin Corbett who has who has never heard of Kevin Corbett before right yes yeah okay Carl. but uh, I've known of him known of Kevin for since you first spoke at the um, Trafalgar Square with Kate Shambarani uh, of the Nelson's Column, mm -hmm. you, you spoke there with your stethoscope and your, your nurse's right. uniform on, and uh, this, this guy <laughs> knew, <laughs> he, he, he knows technically, like, he, he understands the medicine, the industry, the whole Covid thing, um, he's like, he's not just like a, a UK expert, he's a world expert. It's okay, Carol. It's, it's, that's fine. Now. Um, so si since then, I've been following him, and then Kevin came to Darlington about um, uh, six or seven weeks ago, and I <clears throat> had a chat with him. And I knew that there was something in common that I wanted to talk to him about, was because <clears throat> in his CV, which is like four pages long, let, let me just sort of say some of this, right? He's so uh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll skip through them, right? Okay. Can you get that from me? On the Wicked, yeah, is it? For LinkedIn, yeah. All right. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, um, forensic nurse practitioner, uh, senior lecturer at Adult Nursing in Middlesex University, senior lecturer at Canterbury Christchurch College, um, Liverpool, senior fellow, Liverpool, adult nursing, um, primary care. Oh, it goes on and on and on. In his early days, back in the 90s, he was specialised in, um, he was a health development um, officer, HIV at London Borough Hackney, um, lecturer in HIV AIDS uh, at um, Mid May Hospital, and loads and loads of other stuff. He even goes right back to publicity officer for the City of London Corporation. Mm. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, I don't know what that's about, but uh, there's lots of questions here. Come in, well. Yeah. So, um, Thanks, Chris. so the, yeah, just, just take a seat. So, um, yeah. let me just say, um, in the 90s, my brother was diagnosed HIV positive, and um, he was uh, told, he was given a, a, a PCR test, and he was told that he would die in two years. He was living up in Gates it at the time, and, and they said that if he didn't take the AZT drugs, then um, he would die within two years. And they also advised him not to tell his family, not to, and they um, they they got him involved with this um, group called Lighthouse, who whose function was to um, it was like a social group, and it was was to <coughs> canvass people and drug companies to say we need this AZT. You know, it was like a it was a hot house of trying to push their drugs and stuff. And um, he didn't tell us for 18 months. And uh, eventually when he did, it was totally 
in his brain. It was totally, it was, um, there was no sort of um, convincing him otherwise. And um, it was just at that time that my sister and I, uh, we started getting involved, interested in meditation. And uh, there was a group called the Brahma Kumaris. We thought that would be good for Michael to be involved with that as well. And, and it was, it was a kind of a good solace. So uh, it was good, it helped us deal with the whole situation. Um, and it was while we were involved with them that we met Neville Hodgkinson, another colleague of yours, who was also like, he was the correspondent for the Times. He was a science correspondent. And he was, at that time, he was like saying things like, you know, it's not proven, it's not proven that HIV exists. This was in the Times. So it was very prominently being debated and then eventually he got kicked out and um, the debate sort of was lost then. So there's an interesting connection there. Um, so anyway, my poor brother, it was just, even though I, I was started my looking into the whole thing and I could see this is nonsense. The piece, the, the test is nonsense. This, it's all psychological, but obviously they'd isolated him from us, and it, you know his, his mind was set. So anyway, he died in um, 1998. So that was um, my brother Michael. So I don't know, a bit emotional. That's why I don't like talking about it. But anyway, um, so Neville, what was I going to say? Um, we've kept since Dor since we met in Darlington. <coughs> we've kept in touch. Um, he sends me interesting things he finds through uh, WhatsApp, and I send stuff to him. Uh, I was interested to find out that the um, South African government had cited you um, for, for something to do with their mm. case, whatever. And I, last week, um, I came across something interesting myself. Um, uh, a South African doctor was, was giving this really good analogy about how uh, taking the the um, COVID-19 vaccine is like being told to jump out of a plane with a parachute that has holes in it. And um, it was just a really good analogy and it, it fits with me because I used to be in the parachute regiment and I don't know what that was to be like. So I sent it to Kevin and then later that night I realised it was part of a, a big sort of like um, debate that was going on and he was part of the congregation. He was called what the people doing it. So, He's well known around the world, and I don't think there's anybody who's got better um, uh, overview of, of what's going on because um, I, since the since what happened with my brother, yeah, I, I've I've have, have very little faith in in doctors in the medical profession because it, it's all re reductionist, it's all germ theory, and to me. The, the more specialists they get, the more letters they have after their names, it seems the more stupid they get because they're, they're not looking at the whole picture. Whereas coming from an, like a nurse perspective, um, and even though like um, Kevin's like academic, but practical as well, um, he's got a, a good overview picture because um, what's the point of training someone to be a specialist in neurology and then another one specialist in cardiology another one specialist in you know, reproduction whatever but they're all connected to understand how the human body works it's all connected they've, deli they've deliberately separated us like this so it's, re it's refreshing to find uh, a professional like kevin who, who knows this kind of stuff so um right sorry paul couldn't be with us tonight because he's traveling um he'll be back next week um have you met Paul? No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. You meet him another time. And, um... <laughs> yeah, it's, um... We're going to speak for, like, 60, 60 minutes, and then we'll have a break, and then we'll do a question, so call it, after that. And, um... That, that way we, we break up the uh, live stream into two little bits because nobody wants to sit much two hours, it? but if it's like 50 or 60 minutes, you know, watch part A, watch part B, maybe. And, and hopefully over the weeks, months and everything, we'll, we'll get more and more speakers and, um, and build this up. And it, this is like a, a model that any pub can do, any, any local place can do, uh, live stream it. And there's lots of speakers who, who would like to speak. So, um, uh, great. anyway, let's... Um,
Let's a uh, nice welcome to Kevin Corbett. So, am I all right here then? Is this, this okay? Yeah. yeah, you might have to speak up a bit because okay. it's... So, um, good evening and, yeah. and welcome. welcome and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honour to come to, to here. Uh, I wouldn't have got here if it hadn't been for the technology. So, although I'm going to probably spend an hour slagging off technology, especially health technology, without it, I probably would have been another hour late. So, there we go. Anyway, a bit of a joke to start off with. So, just to explain about me, I'm, I'm Dr. Kevin Cooper, and I'm a qualified nurse. And that's not a contradiction. It means that I'm a nurse who's academically qualified to, doctor, to doctorate level, right? So I have, I've got something called a PhD, which goes before my name, right? Unlike your GP or your hospital consultant, most of them are PhDs, although they're called doctors, if they're physicians, Mr. if they're surgeons, yeah? So my background is um, quite interesting because I started off as a registered nurse, qualified as a nurse, in the 1980s. Uh, both my parents were nurses. Uh, my mother was an accident and emergency sister and in the 1960s and 1970s was something called a hospital superintendent, like a deputy matron. My father was director of nursing, which meant he controlled the whole health district. And his last big job was in York, North Yorkshire, not far from here, down the A19. And, um, and, and later on in my career, I was nearly four years at the University of York until the mid-2000s, before I went to John Moore's. So I know here very well. My partner comes from the northeast. So I know Northumberland, and I know this part of the, this neck of the woods a little bit. I know Northumberland and, and, and Gateshead and Newcastle a lot better, because that's where the family has been for 35 years. So, so I know, you know, although I'm from the south, and I sound like I come from the south, I, I have got affinity and family links up here. So um, I hope that gives me some, gives you some assurance that I haven't just sort of Talking from, from the Kevin, can, I, can I just ask something? Would it be is it okay if you come a bit closer, maybe sit okay. down? Because yeah. um, your voice is not very loud and okay. the sound so, not very good. So but last week we had Mark Steele shouting. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not Mark, I'm not a Mark Steele. So um, and Mark's great. He's got great voice, great range. I've got a slightly different voice. So um, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, um, my career started off in nursing, uh, clinical nursing, hands-on. I trained not in an academic program, I trained in an apprenticeship nursing program. Uh, but I was already a, a graduate and a postgraduate qualified in fine art before I went into nursing. And I followed my parents into nursing. And that's very common. And you see that a lot, don't you? In the thing, medicine, law, we follow our parents, right? And I, um, was going to, I said, absolutely not. <laughs> no, no children here are going to be doing the same as us. You're going to do medicine or you're going to do something better. I didn't want to do medicine, never wanted to do medicine. And, um, all through my student days, I worked. Auxiliaries. They're called healthcare assistants now. And, um, you know, because my father was a big director, I could always get a job through him, or he'd know somebody that would hire me. You know, when I went to university in Reading, and I worked at hospitals around Reading in my vacations, yeah? So I always worked as a nurse and auxiliary. So by the time I finished uh, my postgraduate fine art degree in London, had like six years experience of doing hands-on nursing in, in Easter and vacation, summer and Christmas, yeah? I often worked two of those vacations in nursing. I was very interested in nursing. I put it off and then 
When I um, started working, I worked for City of London in the centre of London. That's a bit like a bit like your local authority, but for the centre of London, for the financial district. It's a very dark organisation. Uh, Barbican Centre, which is a big arts centre in the centre of London. And then, you know, first job and all the rest of it, you realise it's not for you. I wanted to do something real. I decided to train as a nurse. So I took myself off. And although I had a BA and an MA, I went into nursing. And, and um, you know, career up. In the first, my second job, working in HIV and AIDS in 1987, right? And uh, um, I'm sure it was a long time ago now, and I wasn't even 30, I was in my late 20s. And it was very similar to what we've been living through in the last 22 months. It was terrifying. terrifying. The fear <clears throat> and hysteria. So I was qualified and I started working in in HIV, and I became a charge nurse, and I went through the whole gamut of, you know, the whole tier of jobs, right up to what's called a specialist. So I became a nurse specialist. And you've probably seen nurse specialists today, or nurse practitioners today in your general practice, yeah? Yeah, you know, they do a lot of the jobs that a physician does, that your GP does, yeah? and they prescribe. We were doing the same sorts of things in the 1980s and the early 1990s. And then I moved into the university teaching and training and doing research. I needed a master's degree and a, a doctoral study. And my doctoral study in the 1990s was on HIV. And I was very interested in the tests, the medical tests, how people were diagnosed. And um, of course, the PCR test you all heard about now, you know, polymerase chain reaction test. This was new in the 1990s, very new. And HIV was the first medical disease that that test was used to do anything with. It was the first disease that the PCR test was used to diagnose and to help treat. And this is very interesting because um, if you get diagnosed with HIV, it's not initially the test that's used, it's an antibody test. You've heard of antibody tests in the last 22 months with COVID. You've heard of lateral flow tests, haven't you? Uh, they're slightly different, but antibody tests, we can do antibody tests for COVID to see if you've got you know, any antibodies, you've got any resistance to it, but they're not doing that at the moment. In the 1980s, that's how you were diagnosed with HIV. You were diagnosed through an antibody test. They didn't isolate the virus from your blood. They put your blood with a manufactured set of proteins that they say were HIV proteins, and they saw if those proteins and your blood interacted. And if your blood had antibodies to those proteins, it was a positive result. Over a certain level, it would be a positive result. So that's how I got involved in the whole you know, PCR thing, because I, uh, as a nurse specialist, had lots of patients on my caseload in the 1990s who were diagnosed HIV. Like Chris said, and Chris mentioned his brother. I hope you don't mind if I re-mention no, him, because you put a good example there. Thank you very much. Um, they were told if they're HIV positive on the basis of one antibody test, they were told that they would be dead in a year, 18 months, two years. Yeah, Really, really severe judgment meted out to people. And if somebody in a white coat tells you that, it has a huge effect, yeah? Because it carries the authority and the power that goes with medicine. And in this culture now, since probably the 1910s, 1920s, the power of religion has been diluted and evaporated. And in its place, the power of medicine has grown and taken over. 
So I knew patients that were told in 1984, when the HIV antibody test first came in, they'd be dead in a year. Dead. And, and they didn't. They lived. And the ones that died very quickly were the ones that took the new drugs, the anti-HIV drugs, especially the early generation of drugs like Zidovudine or AZ, as it's called, which is the first one that came out in 1987. Just like now you've got the COVID drugs coming out. You've heard in the last few weeks, there's new drugs for COVID, antivirals, yeah, I'm not saying they're as deadly as DZT and drugs like that, but they cannot be. They cannot be that safe because the time to develop them from uh, genesis to market, from lab to market, is so short that the phase three studies on them have not been done. Yeah. I'll come on to that a bit later. <clears throat> Just to go back to my history then. So I was part of this whole field of HIV right up to the 1990s, right? <clears throat> I was well known. I'd been a charge nurse, a senior nurse, nurse specialist, lecturer, lecturer practitioner. I ran the nursing in a big uh, special sexual health clinic, the big London teaching hospital. I was the top nurse along with the matron for the service. Then I went off to do my doctorate. A couple of years before, I'd done a master's degree in respiratory medicine, which had also been my specialty. So I knew all about chest complaints, masks, all the rest of it, all the way through the 80s. Right to 1989, 1990, I was a specialist in respiratory Nursing. It was London, and it was an experiment on respiratory patients, an ethical experiment to help them learn about their condition. So I knew about respiratory medicine when I became a, a, a specialist in HIV. So my HIV PhD, I wanted to look at the tests and people's experiences of the tests, what it felt like to go through testing, what were the problems with it, yeah? And as part of that, of course, uh, and I was doing a PhD in social science, not in virology, not in physiology, but in social science, looking at people's experiences of the testing, yeah? What does it feel like when you go to your doctor? What does it feel like when you get the diagnosis? when you look at the result, the test result. So I was looking at all this as a social scientist, looks at perceptions and experiences, and to do that properly, I had to have a better grounding in the science, in the medical science, right? So I was well known, I was a lecturer, sessional, le a part-time lecturer at the Royal Marsden Hospital, I don't know if you know that, it's a big cancer hospital in, in, in London. There's two sites, Chelsea and down in South London. And its degree for nurses was validated by the University of Manchester. And I taught on their programs and I taught HIV to those student, those nursing students, all qualified nurses. And I also was an external examiner for the Royal Marsden for four years as a nurse lecturer. So, so there we are. I took myself off to learn about these tests a little bit more because I was very concerned as a nurse specialist that I had nearly 360 people on my caseload who were HIV positive. Only at any one time would 20 of those, 25 of those be really unwell. The rest <coughs> looked perfectly okay. They weren't ill. They had no symptoms. They were test positive. That's what they were. They had a test positive. They had no symptoms. They were asymptomatic, but they tested positive. What does that remind you of? And this was 1995 I started my doctor research. So because I had a lot of contacts in health, 
and hospitals. And I worked all over London, and I knew all the HIV services, and I knew a lot of people in the hospitals. I could negotiate my way into laboratories, probably unofficially, but in those days you could do that if you did it ethically. You, you know, you asked who ran the laboratories, you asked the infection control doctors or nurses that were involved in the labs, yeah, the testing. And they, they'd let you come in and do a day's observation. So I started learning about how HIV was diagnosed, how it was diagnosed. Because before then, I did what happened to Chris's brother. People came to me in my health centre in North London. I was part of community nursing. I was located as a nurse specialist in district nursing. You know district nurses? I worked with them, health visitors, school nurses, and I had an office alongside all the GPs in the health centre. GPs used to refer people to me. All the GPs in the district referred people to me to test because they didn't want to do it. They didn't know how to do it. They didn't know how to counsel people for the test. But to do the test, I'd, I'd counsel people, I'd tell them the pros and cons, then they decide whether they want it or not. I'd take the blood, do the form, get the patient to sign consent, obviously, before I do anything, and send the blood off to the lab. And then I get the, the, the result back in probably two weeks. Then you'd have to give the result to the patient. Yeah? Easy if it's a negative. Not always. Not so easy if it's a positive. Not always. People expect things. You, you'd be surprised. But I didn't know what happened once the blood went to the lab. Yeah? And silly me, you know, specialist, it's in all my books. I hadn't read about the antibody tests. <clears throat> hadn't read about how the antibody tests work. But somewhere in my mind, I thought, hang on a second. This is a live organism. Surely it is identified from the blood somewhere. Yeah? You know, you actually get a picture of it. You actually get a, a, a microscopic slide of it that you can enlarge and you can see the organism, yeah? It's not, not unnatural to think that, is it? Well, wrong. HIV is a retrovirus, not a virus, slightly different to a normal virus. And it is not iso isolatable from human blood unless great efforts are made. And even then, something like 80 to 60% of the time, you can't isolate it. Interesting, isn't it? So when I go to the lab, and I won't tell you what big London hospital it was, I was in the lab one day, and they were running the HIV antibody tests for all the patients uh, that they sampled, uh, that were you know, being tested. And um, it's uh, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. That's the posh word for an ELISA test, which is the common antibody test. It's still used, and this is the 1990s. And the Department of Health, um, or Public Health in England, it's called Public Health Laboratory Service in those days, the official algorithm for the testing was there. And, and so the results come through, the machine reads the blood samples, because it's, it's something called optical density reading. So the machine reads the, the, the intensity of the light, it's a bit, a bit like a, a bulb really, through the blood the blood, the blood um, sample. And it records the reading as a number, and if it's above a certain level or below a certain level, it's positive or negative, yeah? So I said, oh, the, the technician was there, and she's telling me about this. And I said, so you know you've got all these positives, all these negatives, then that can be given to the patient, can't it? You know, they can be told. Oh, no, she said, we, we, we don't do that, we can't do that. And she said, anyway, those positive and negatives don't mean a positive or a negative diagnosis. Interesting. And I said, well, what does it mean? She said, well, they're positive on the first or second run. She said, um, the consultant, medical consultant over there, and he's sitting in his office, has to come down, take those positive and negatives, and look at the risk factors of who's donated the blood, the risk factors, the risk group that the person's in. 
And that's really interesting, and I hadn't appreciated that. So, and I said, what do you mean? Whether they're gay, bisexual, heterosexual, black African, um, haemophiliac, drug user, what their exposure group is, yeah? Do you all understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. <laughs> so... These are other factors that have nothing to do with Medical, physical. This is an so so this so so this laboratory <coughs> reading that a machine and the machine reads it, and if you've got a point three four reading with a gay man and a point three four reading with a heterosexual male, it may not mean the same thing, even though the reading's the same. And I said, well, I hadn't appreciated that. So epidemiology is the science of how diseases move through groups of, pa groups of people. It's the study of epidemics, epidemiology. Ology is a, a study, it's you know, a fancy name for a discipline, studying something. Epidemic is what we're told has been happening in the last 22 months, which I totally question. And this is how it is applied to the blood test with HIV. So I started looking at this, you know, and you know, I don't know, because as a researcher, you know, as a researcher doing my masters, I've got a researcher's mind. I trained as an artist. Artists are researchers as well. And we're all researchers, for God's sake. We're all researchers, you know. Any of us that are switched on, we question things and we go to get the answers. And what I found is a bit like a telescope. As I went further and further into this, it was like chasing that rabbit. <laughs> is, it, is it Alice in Wonderland that chases this rabbit? And you she never can catch it, can she? And there I was, like, nurse specialist. I was, by that time, I'd been a lecturer, and by that time, I was working uh, in local authority in public health. I was working in public health. There's a paid officer in public health around HIV and public health, you know, environmental health. I was located in. I was a PO2 officer in environmental health. And I started thinking, I've given people these diagnoses without even knowing this. So I started talking to this technician, I started getting information off her, and then I started looking, and I found the algorithm, public health algorithm, for diagnosing HIV. And it was saying that the same optical density reading in one epidemiological group is treated differently, is treated with suspect, but in other groups, a negative result can be given as a negative diagnosis without any suspicion. So if you were gay, bisexual, a um, haemophiliac, or any other group that was suspect, like a prostitute woman, how, how does anybody know you are those things? You, know, you go into a sexual health clinic, and a nurse or a doctor asks you who you have sex with, and you say a man, if you're a male, or you say a woman, does that mean you're heterosexual or you're bisexual or you're gay? Those terms, those identities, don't translate to anything for a lot of people, yeah? You know? So to put a label on people is also wrong, but also to treat uh, 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 you know, a material reading differently depending on people's sexual orientation <coughs> and depending on their race, for God's sake. Because black African in this country became a risk group in the 80s, yeah, for HIV. So just being black, just being from a Caribbean or black African, Afro Caribbean racial background you'd be targeted for testing because you'd be seen to be an HIV risk. So we better test you, yeah? Like gay men in the 1980s were targeted for testing. 
right? They were targeted for testing as, you know, the typhoid Marys, the disease group that's going to infect everybody, yeah? And those of you who remember the 1980s, remember The Sun, The Daily Mirror, all the tabloid headlines vilifying these groups of people, yeah? Prostitute women were seen like this, as dangerous, the calls for quarantine, calls for rounding people up, just like now, basically, just like now. So I learned all this well into my HIV career, right? And I started looking at the HIV antibody tests and two major ones then, and I found that they hadn't really isolated HIV as in extracted it from the blood of patients. And they couldn't. There were studies where they were unable to do that. But they used these antibody tests where these are the proteins from the original patients. So we manufacture, you know, synthetic proteins like those and we put them with your blood and if it tests positive, then you've got it or you haven't got it, yeah? And if you're from one of those risk groups, your blood, even if it's negative, goes back in for retesting <coughs> at least three times. At until least until they get the result they want. Until they get three times the same result. But the more you test, the more likely it's going to be positive. Yeah? So it's, it's statistical, it, it's more like... It's a tautology. Subjective. It's a self-fulfilling um, self prophecy. The more you do it, the more you'll find positives. Why wasn't it done blind? Why wasn't? Why, why, why weren't the tests just blind? So you didn't know the background or anything about it? Because that positive and negative could not be converted from a laboratory reading into a medical diagnosis unless that consultant physician. And I said, so, I said to that technician, so what happens if you don't know the risk? Oh, they'll phone the doctor up. If you don't know the risk group, the patient, if the doctor's taken the blood without taking the full history, we will phone the doctor and get them to re-interview the patient. Then she said to me, watch this then, when he comes down, when the consultant pathologist comes down, consultant pathologist in a path lab, in an NHS path lab, is the medically trained, the physician, basically, that oversees the conversion of the readings from the chemical reactions into a diagnosis, yeah? Not just for HIV, but for any condition, any test, yeah? There has to be a physician legally to make a diagnosis or a nurse practitioner, an equivalent, yeah? Is but that why they have signed a paperwork for as well? It has to be a physician, yeah? So <laughs> long comes the physician a few hours later, because she said, if you don't believe me, because I was questioning all this, and she said, look, wait until he comes down and you'll see what... And he'll go through the sheets that come from the doctors with the blood results, and he'd be looking for the risk grouping of the patient. Because it's on, for HIV, they had a special form, and it was on all, and probably still is, where you've got to put the risk group, the exposure category of the, the donor, the blood donor, yeah? The blood who you're testing, yeah? You've got to put the exposure category, and they can't translate the laboratory reading into a medical diagnosis without that, yeah? And he came down, there were several negatives that he couldn't sign off as negative diagnosis because there was suspicion over the exposure category, yeah? So I started looking at this and I thought, <coughs> this is strange. So I found that HIV hadn't been, you know, I, that scientists were claiming that HIV had been isolated and it's because it's difficult to isolate it. And Luke Montagnier is the famous um, Pasteur Institute professor who got the Nobel Prize for, I was going to say inventing it, but that's the wrong word, for identifying it, for isolating it. But he admitted on many films in the 1990s, many video interviews, that they didn't really purify it. They didn't need to, because they were able to 
determine the genetic structure. Yeah. So this brings us on to COVID in a minute, because it's exactly the same arguments for COVID. So they didn't need to purify it. And if you read Luc Montagnier's book, it's a small book, it's called Virus, I think it's page nine. He makes this statement that they used antibody tests on patients because to isolate it wasn't successful and it took up to six months to do that, to find out if it worked or not. And you can't take six months to diagnose patients, yeah? You've got to do it like this, yeah? You've got to do it like this, yeah? You've got to do it fairly quickly. You can't take six months to hang about. And what was happening in the 1970s is all these patients with AIDS, because this is 1984 HIV was isolated, identified, became a, a, a phenomenon in the 1980s, 1984. AIDS patients are around from the late 70s, yeah? Onwards, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, 29 pre-existing diseases, yeah? were AIDS, and um, science didn't know the cause, but these people were dying of these unusual diseases, which were well known, the AIDS indicator diseases. They were well known right back to the 19th century. Kaposi's sarcoma, pneumocystis pneumonia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, all sorts of diseases, viral diseases like cytomegalovirus. Now, in 84, when HIV was found, they then said HIV causes AIDS. All these strange manifestations are due to one virus, right? There's no paper to show that, that they scientifically proved that. And Carrie Mollis is always quoted as saying that, but there was no citation in the medical literature that he could find to show that HIV was proven to cause AIDS. It was a supposition. It was an assumption, right? And come back to me in the 1990s, sitting at the top of my nice career with HIV, was rapidly unfolding in front of me. I could see, as I did my doctoral study, the antibody tests, my career in HIV was built on a fiction. It was built on a, a, a misguided science due to technology, really, really high-tech high, high tech stuff, medical technology, antibody testing. We didn't have those antibody tests in the 1970s in the same way. We didn't have the T-cell tests, which we used on HIV patients. The T4 count. Where the T-cell tests only came in the late 70s. So this whole phenomenon of HIV came with the new medical technology. So I was doing the antibody tests. I looked at those and I could see my career dissolving in front of me. I was thinking, well, what am I going how can I go back and work in this field, you know? How can I give somebody a diagnosis knowing this that, you know, oh, I didn't tell you. I looked at what the manufacturers of the antibody, HIV antibody tests said about the tests. Abbott Laboratories, Aston Laboratories, all, I looked at 25 pharmaceutical companies' data sheets on their own HIV antibody tests. All of them said, you can test positive for all sorts of reasons other than having the virus. Like, a prior pregnancy. How many women know they've had a prior pregnancy? How many women miscarry that knowing they've, they've even miscarried sometimes? Yeah? And they will have antibodies due to that that will cross-react on the HIV test. You can test HIV positive if you've had a blood transfusion. How many people know that? You can test positive from having an immunization. That's got nothing to do with HIV and having sex. Are there any drugs that kill the HIV people? Test one undesirable? Is that best you want to say? Well, I would, 
I don't need to say that, but I mean, those groups I mentioned were seen as undesirables. Yeah. yeah. They were seen in those days so as don't kill them anymore. expendable communities yeah. to some extent. So, and I had a lot of trouble in my nursing career when I was a staff nurse and a charge nurse. I was working on HIV wards, right? The patients were DNR'd. Do you know what that means? I'm not talking about people in their 90s here or in their hundreds. I'm talking about people in their 20s and 30s, right? And I, I had great difficulty with this ethically, as a lot of nurses did. I ended up resuscitating patients on my own with a defibrillator, right? If you know what that is, it's a machine that starts the heart. And the cardiac arrest team standing there and saying, what are you doing? Yeah? And I'm saying, I'm doing it. And if you don't, I'm going to report you. Yeah? But he's not for resus. I say, he's 35. Yeah? And this is exactly where we were with COVID last year. Is worse, really. This is where I was in 1987-88, getting into trouble on the wards because I saw the ethical issues here, the the sort of mindset of we're only going so far, and then that's it. We're not putting them in intensive care, you know. And 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 you know, it's just incredible to me. I'd worked intensive care, I'd worked in coronary care a bit, and and. A new disease, and I would say, a new disease, you don't know what's around the corner. Maybe it's going to be a cure next year. Oh, no. Doctors say no, there's going to be no cure. There are no hopers. Okay, uh, Kevin, uh, yeah, so, okay. so, well, kind of, kind of round this up. And then we'll have should I come time. back up to date? So, mm -hmm. so basically, to come up to date, a lot of what I've said will resonate with what's happened in the last 22 months. Asymptomatic, no symptoms, but test positive. That's the PCR for COVID, yeah? The third test I dealt with in my doctorate was the PCR. And that was new in 1995 when I started my doctorate. It took weeks for it to come back. Weeks, something like three weeks, right? I noticed a lot of my patients, they were very consumers like consumers buying something. They go to this clinic, have their PCR test, they go to that one. So they get a viral load, they get a PCR result at Hospital A, it'd be, you know, almost non-existent. They do another PCR test up the road at another hospital across London a week later, and they'd be told they're dying. Totally variable results, yeah? So I looked at the PCR test in 1997 for HIV. And do you know what it said? It's in my doctorate, page 71. It said, is the amplicor, the ASIM PCR for HIV, sorry, the amplicor PCR, amplicor was the name of the test, uh, the amplicor is the, the trade name of the test. And it said, the PCR for HIV is not a medical diagnostic and should not be used to diagnose patients. It's only a tool to help stage the disease. That was emboldened in the, the data sheets from the drug companies, right? So way back in the 1990s, I knew what everybody started parroting last year, which is, it's not a diagnostic, yeah? So that technology from the 90s to last year, you know, which is, you know, 2020, that's, you know, best part of 25 years, became very sophisticated, quicker to do, very performative. You could run it in minutes, basically. And it's in every lab, in every path lab, in every country. You know, you even get it now, you even get these PCR tests back in, in something like under an hour, Yeah. Okay, Kevin, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this in, in part two, but just, just to, to, to round this, round this, just to round this, <coughs> this section off, there, there's, there's another bit which I, I think it needs to be understood yeah. by the generation of today, is that, um, I <laughs> um, is, is that back in the 90s, there, there, were, there was a very different social attitude towards um, gay men, 
like drug users, well, well particularly being, being gay, that, that was, uh, it was seen as a, uh, it was only in the 1950s that Alan Turing, the, the guy who invented the internet, the computers and stuff, was uh, was chemically castrated because he was was mm. gay. So it was a very different attitude then. It was a very um, so so like the fact that my brother could, didn't could couldn't mm. even mention it to his, his family. Because yeah. was, and if I could just yeah. come on about that, I think the, whatever we think about people's behaviours, right? We mustn't make any assumptions about people here tonight. Whatever we think individually about it, I think. The key historical thing to think about that's factual is all those groups in the 1980s were on the edge. They're on the fringe, yeah? Right? When you live on the fringe, right, it's a different way of living, yeah? You're not in the mainstream, right? Bring back terrorists. Yeah? And to some extent, you're off the radar. That's good, yeah? Maybe it's bad on another level because you know if you've got people that are divorced from their communities, are hived off into a, some sort of um, subculture where society doesn't really care about them. Yeah, and look at prostitute women. Look, look at prostitute women. Look at the, the Yorkshire Ripper. Look how he could get away with it for years. Because, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, the judges would say, well, they deserved it, didn't they? You know, they're streetwalkers. What did they expect? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Society judges people on the, on, the, on the fringe, right? And people having those judgments, whether we like it or not, were expendable. They were vulnerable, highly vulnerable groups, right? Highly vulnerable groups, right? Highly vulnerable. That doctors could come along in the 1980s and say, like they did with me and a 35-year-old patient, he's dying now, and they wrote a prescription for morphine that was a lethal dose. And this wasn't just a, a consultant, it was a professor of medicine. And I went up against them, and I struck the, the I struck it off the medical chart with a red pen and signed it, you know. And the patient lived for four and a half years because we took charge of it as nurses and we wouldn't let medical killing operate, right? That's just one example, right? And to me, that was nearly every day on that ward I worked on, that specialist ward in the 1980s, the HIV ward that Princess Diana opened. You can see all that on the internet. And we all look wonderful and everything. The reality was, he was going to work in a war zone and trying to protect the troops, yeah? You know? When your own side is trying to kill them, yeah? That's exactly what yeah, it is. So when you... Oh, okay, sorry. Can we, let, let's just bring them to a halt there, right? Because yeah. uh, we've come to like 60 minutes. We're, yeah. We're going to do a, a question for Corbyn. Oh, when you so, have 45, yeah, oh, no, on, on my time. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, coming up, a question for Corbett uh, next, but uh, Kevin Corbett, let's give a round of applause. Thank you for your talk. So, how long do you want to... Good. I cut that exactly on 59 minutes. minutes. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well yeah. Because, you know, people are looking on the internet. Yeah. How long are you going to be... Yeah. Uh, so, we'll just have a five, ten minute break. Yeah. Get, get me more drinks. I'm sure you've got some good questions. We'll, we'll do some questions for Corbyn. And we'll do some <laughs> you know who Jim Brown was? I know Jim. I know Jim. I know Jim. Yeah. No relation. The guy from the first. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he's still going. Yeah. He, um, he said that his parents came. Yeah. So I asked him. Yeah. 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 Y
all right. You beat Matt, haven't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. How are you doing? How is it going? That's all went from that. We're working, man. We all that. We're just finishing. Wait, I'm going to just get a practitioner. Yeah, I don't work on the ambulance anymore, but. I work agency, so yeah. I mean, I'm as good as gone, aren't I? So my, my missus is a nurse. She's till we get sacked tonight at the nurse's home. She's working. So yeah, so difficult times, but you've got to take the battle on, haven't you? Um, do you think that as many people as they're saying have had it in the health service? I think I can only speak from my experience. I think that the big I know the percentage is a great for them. It's, a, it's quite sad, but I don't know if that's just the, what, the hospital I'm working yeah. in or the, the teams I'm working in. Where I've just got back from eventually, I fact I'm working as like a, a home visiting practitioner, yeah. two GPs are not yeah. going out. Um, and we're a team of normally there's about five every day, but there's probably about ten of us that yeah. in, in the mingle between the shifts all in. And I would say nine of them out of the ten of us, that's all it's only me that's not injected. Um at Scarborough Hospital. It's difficult because the people don't really talk about things, you know, they don't want to say whether they are or not, but I know the teams I work with most of them are, you know, um, but you hear certain, there's, there's pockets, isn't there, but I, I, it's just not enough of us really for any no, sort of no. battle, I don't think. There's no, I mean, it's now about work around to see yeah, yeah. what can survive. But what I've done, I mean, I've gone and done um, a, a, a mic construction course, so... That's about to set up that other business, and I'm already yeah. I'm in the fruition of doing that. Um, I'm quite skilled in other ways. You know, I'm a survivor, you've got to be, haven't you? Yeah. At the end of the day, I'm not being coerced into anything. Yeah. You know? I'm principled. Well, that's yeah. principled. It's, it's, yeah. it's just blatantly wrong, isn't it, as we know from, from what we, the knowledge we have so far. Um, but, it's incredible, isn't it? Oh, so, I can't believe where we're at, you know? But I did say, I mean, I, I sold my house. Um, and they don't confirm this. I sold my house last, uh, sorry, February just gone. Beautiful home that we had to move back into one we used to rent out, which is smaller, got loads of work with it. Because we knew it was coming, but we knew we could go, we could free our finances up more. And, and not, yeah. So we made all these stress, I knew it was coming, you know. So I, I put all these things into fruition. Um, so we were in a better position to say, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's still not right, you know. I mean, I, I was a paramedic for 15 years or so, um, worked at the time, working as an ECP. Where did you qualify? Do you mind me asking? As a paramedic? Yeah. Uh, I, I worked for Tenyas, it was. So I did my training through Tenyas. Yeah. Um, oh, that's still at the spot. That's still at the spot. My ECP training, I've done through um, Teesside University. Teesside, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So my missus, she's a nurse through Teesside. She used to be an ITU nurse, but she works in the nursing homes now. So she would have, well, she would have by midnight tonight. Uh, but we, um, is it the PJH? via the um, uh, Global Veterans Alliance, the letter yeah. they put together. Yeah. Um, so we, we've served them with that. Um, we had a chat with them. And to be fair to the, 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 the bosses, they don't want to finish it. She's a good nurse. They don't want to go down this road because they're going to lose a lot of, well, I say a lot of staff. We know three people out of the three or four homes that they have. Um, most have just complied and just went, oh, okay, and then yeah. just jumped in for it, sadly. Um, but they didn't understand. They said, oh, but we'll put our funding. You know, we've tried to... I said, look, it's, it's not them that we are serving here. It's you guys that are going to be local. You, you're going to be liable for any decision. They're bullying you. We're throwing the hot potato back to you. You throw it to them. It's for you guys to get together and start to push, push back up the line. So they're not doing that. They're just complying at that level because it's their money. It's their, you know, that's how they're looking at it. And that's how they've got people. People are inherently greedy and don't even care about each other anymore, do they? So, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like a feeding power, isn't it? Yeah, it is. 
you know, and people's, even people, I mean, I know a professor of nursing who's got a PhD in biochemistry, and he knows all about this. He's going to have the booster. He felt cheated having the double jab. And I said, if I don't have the booster, all my livelihood goes because the university. Yeah, but if he knows what, why is he doing that? Well, that's just crazy because their material well being depends on it. But what he'll be thinking about his pension, about what he's not going to get his pension yeah, potentially. Got, yeah. I think he's got an overseas business that goes alongside his university job. You know? But if it doesn't help you and it's potentially going to kill you, which the, the, the more that you have, the more it's going to, so you're going to you know, the issue is it's going to kill you, then. What's the point? I know, but this is what people, people are sort of trapped like flies in a fly paper, you know, because they can't make that decision to put, you know, the um, phys physical or spiritual health yeah, yeah. ahead of the material. No, no. And I think that they've obviously been in plans for a lot of years, they've been very clever at tying everybody in debt, haven't they? Which fortunately I was aware of and started to get myself out of all that sort of thing over the last couple of years. And I said, look, we, you know, we're not living like that. You know, we've got to be free to be able to say no. And we can make our own decisions on the fact that I can go and dig holes and put fences up if I have to. You know, I'll do anything. You know, as long as it's. Yeah, quick question. Yes, yeah, sure. I really want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I really want to have a physician when he was. He was the one. The one I. Different, different yeah, 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 it's going to work. Yeah. They're not going to throw it out with headlights, are they? AIDS diseases. Don't have a chance to say that. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of doctors do question this. I found there were doctors in the 1990s who question this. In the 1980s, medical doctors, physicians, biomedical people, they questioned it. They were ignored. So I found those people. You know, I found their literature, what they published. They're not the ones running the labs in the NHS. Just another question. I've just mentioned the guy who's on it. For example, you have that Professor Neil Ferguson, I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with him. I mean, he's the one, no matter what he's done, he seems to pop things up. Um, no doubt he's a clever lad. He's, he's got a track record of popping things up. He absolutely has. We know what I'm doing with all of the from the off of mouth disease. Shocking. What I'm saying is this, he's a no doubt a clever man. You know, surely the, the information's out there. Who's pulling these strings? Who's actually saying that? Because he was wrong. There's the certain things going on that are wrong. Who's actually pulling these strings? Once the HIV test, once it's out of the hospital, officially authorised, it's in every clinic, every lab, in any NHS. And it was on the menu, you know, things to choose from when patients presented with symptoms. And it was done so quickly, you know, it was a trial for years and years and years. Just like this PCR test now with COVID. It's done very quickly because of this idea of what drove it. Went ahead of any rational approach. I remember it well. I'm 52. I remember it well. The Royal Society was terrorised. Yeah, yeah, terrorised. I understand that. But I'm not about to have with this professor. Who is telling it? Or is he just a subversive? The history of college. The Imperial College. The one grant. The seven twenty-nine. Fifteen million dollars in one grant, and they have grants in Chinese. So it's these interests. So they're just being bought off. So, so that's one way of putting it. But they're vested interests, you know, not necessarily conspiracy. 
the best time to test the to show that the internet protect the money. And so the H when HIV was identified, the antibody test, the following day the patents were submitted, the patents were tested, and they made billions of years. So once it's patented, you've had it. You can never get it unpatented. So what they said is Professor yes. 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 You know, virologists, epidemiologists, social scientists, they're sort of an elite group clean our university. We didn't even know who they were. And they're all funded through these vested interests, you know, their grants. Even Chris Whitty, he's had millions and millions of gains in the pharmaceutical industry. So they're not going to turn around and say, these tests don't work, you know. If they perform, and you can run them, they work. Now, if you look at um, Professor Anderson Pollard, who is a professor of public health, um, Newcastle or Tyne University. She said, just what I'm saying, is these tests were never trialed and they were never properly validated before they were, you know, you shouldn't be testing kids that are low risk or no risk for COVID. You shouldn't be vaccinating them either or injecting them. You shouldn't be, you know, they went into, the army went into, before last Christmas, the army went into Liverpool and tested all the school. Yeah. So they, so that's why it's vested interest. Yes, you could say they're bought off. In effect, that's what's happened. But the vested interest will create the evidence. So the, 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 the mainstream creates the evidence, and the fringe scientists get to wish that. So personally, the kind of crime, it's like the evidence for the crime is on the It's like if you said there, which I've worked it out anyway. The Gaining know what, the ground, yes. They know what the narrative is, they know what the agenda is, yes. so they've got to fit the evidence. So yes, they do, yes. So they create the evidence to fit that narrative. Yeah. <laughs>